Hello everyone, welcome to Geo Plus Finance session. We have six different presentations plans for today. Uh, as you know, you can ask all the questions on our Slack, also on our YouTube chat. And the first presentation will be by Wang Kung Kao about geospatial data mining using R. The floor is yours. Hello everyone, this is Guang Kung here. Welcome to my talk about the uh, geospatial data mining using R. I hope you are getting back from your lunch or stay a little bit longer uh, after the panel because I'll be the first speaker in this session. Um, so something about my technical background. I spent many years in doing research in multimedia retrieval, especially in the area of represent representation learning from different information sources. Now I'm working in the uh, automotive industry doing data analytics for self-driving cars. It hasn't been long that I started using R, but I find it a fantastic analytics language with good libraries for making plots, spatial analysis, statistics, and so on. Here on the right, I can show you a picture of my home setup. Uh, so I'm a Vim user. Um, I use Anaconda, Jupyter Notebook, and web browser to show the, uh, the plots and so on and so forth. So today I will use the uh, air pollution problem to show the power of uh, geospatial mine, data mining using R. And analyzing this type of data can deepen our understanding about the problem and eventually improve our quality of life. So the main course of air pollution is energy use and production. So burning fossil fuels uh, creates a lot of gases and chemicals, which lead to smoke and haze. And there are also natural causes, uh, such as wildfire. Uh, but I would say it's, they are still the, uh, the indirect consequences from the climate change. Here on the right, I show you a typical hazy day in California and a wildfire, which is still ongoing, as I suppose. So the Atmosphere is a medium uh, for air chemical reactions. And the dispersion and transport of air pollution depends on the wind, turbulence, and air temperature. It has a heavy impact on our health as well. So it can create eye irritation, heart, and lung problems. We are particularly interested in the, uh, the particles. So they, are, they can be divided into two types. If it is bigger than 2.5 micrometer, it's called uh, coarse particles. And if it's below than that, or smaller than that, it's fine particle. And the measure that we use to report daily air quality is the uh, air quality index, AQI. We can also model it using a Gaussian model or SMAC model, which I will come back to it later. So we can also rate the pollution levels based on AQIs. So if the AQI is below 50, we say the air quality is good. If it's between 50 and 100, uh, the air is moderate. And if it's 100 uh, and more, then we consider it as unhealthy. So I used the uh, 2016 California data for our analysis. It can be obtained from the, uh, a website of US Environmental Protection Agency. In total, there are 62 stations monitoring the uh, air quality in California. And I can also export the uh, coordinates to a GeoJSON file and show it on a map using the uh, Cubius, which is um, you know the uh, geospatial data visualization tool. So now here you see that the uh, they are scattered in the uh, metropolitan area around or in the uh, California state. So now we can also compute the average AQI and show it on on the map, and also we group it by the county. 
So here you see that the, um, the, the yellowish color means the air is polluted. Uh, green means the air is clean. And the counties in gray means there is no station there. So since one station also represents the, uh, the air quality of their uh, city. So we can also rank the city by the AQIs. And here we can see that the, uh, uh, all these uh, the pollution levels or the, uh, the average AQIs in each city. I would say the um, most cities enjoy a clean air, but the air quality in some cities is still moderate or slightly polluted. We can also compute the uh, AQI by month in the uh, most polluted cities. Here we see that the uh, Ontario uh, has a steady air pollution level throughout the year, while Bakerfield and Cochrane are more po polluted during the win winter season. Just for information, Ontario is close to the LA city, Bakerfield is to the north, a little bit to the north, and Cochrane is almost in the middle of uh, California state. So here comes the question. What happens if you want to measure the AQI in every city of California? Because we only have a limited number of uh, stations, so we have to introduce more information and formulate a model around it. So here I can show you the, uh, the all these uh, places of interest in green, and we only have limited uh, number of um, stations colored in blue. So here comes the, uh, the new information, SMAC model. So SMAC stands for the uh, Community Multiscale Air Quality. It is an open source project uh, with a bunch of programs to simulate the air quality. It provides sound estimates of particles, ozone, toxics, and so on. So it produces a gridded output and we extract the, uh, the area over the California state for our analysis. So here comes our solution. So we couple the observations from the uh, monitoring stations with the SMAC outputs. And we use the spatial Bayesian method to model the point reference data. So here point reference data means the, uh, the data with coordinates. So essentially, it is a Gaussian spatial process model uh, with a linear relationship between the uh, SMAC output and the, uh, the station uh, outputs. So W here is the uh, Gaussian process uh, as a priori. Also, it exploits the, uh, the, uh, the distance between locations I and J with a covariance matrix. And epsilon here is the uh, model uh, for the uh, measurement arrows. There are also some technical details I want to tell. So we gathered the uh, California city data from Kaggle. It only provides the, uh, the coordinates. So we have to do a reverse geocoding to get the address. I will provide the, uh, uh, the code in the GitHub repo later and you can check them how, how, we, how we did it. So we also adopt the uh, SMAC results from the closest grid output. Uh, we convert the uh, long and lag to the UTM system so that we can measure the distance between the locations. And our model uses the square root of AQIs. Um, parameter estimation using the Monte Carlo Markov chain takes a long time, as you know. So now, we can fill the uh, map with the uh, predicted AQIs and show that the uh, show it on this map. And you can see that the um, the Southern California is more polluted than the North, quite obviously. 
And now we also have the uh, predicted AQIs in every city of California. And also we can count the number of days spent in each AQI level. So here we show you the uh, 50 most polluted cities in LA County. I would say that the, um, so it's, the air in most cities is good, but, they, the, but all of them uh, have less than 300 days of good air. And you see that the LA city is stands somewhere in the middle. So also it has uh, some polluted days. So here are the references. The first one is the, uh, the air quality textbook. And the second and third talks about the uh, spatial variation method that we discussed. Some takeaway messages. So R provides powerful open source packages for geospatial data mining and visualization. And this, this, the, tech, the similar techniques that we discussed today can be applied to disease mapping, crime mapping, traffic accident mapping, etc. Uh, as a command line user, I, I see that there's still room for improvement. I'm hoping that there will be an inline debugger so that I can program more easily. So feel free to contact me through email. I will soon release the code on the uh, GitHub repo, and I do have a LinkedIn page. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I will check if we have any questions. We have, because we still have three minutes left. Yeah, so there's no question on YouTube chat, but as a reminder, everyone can ask questions la later on our YR Slack. Yeah, okay. so Thank you. thanks again. So our second presentation will be from Thomas Hyde, and he will talk about visualizing graph problems onto the maps. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Martin, for the introduction and welcome to the second talk here in the YR spatial, geospatial uh, session. And my talk is about uh, with the title, which places can I reach by bus visualizing this graph problem onto maps. So as the title says, yeah, Thomas, we, we, can see bus. The, we can see your presentation actually. So Oh. I think you're not sharing your screen. Sorry. Then I... So now... Now you can see my screen. No, no still nothing. Nope. Share, yes. Yeah, now it's working. Thanks. Now it's working. Hey, sorry for this um, inconvenient. So, so, as already told, my title is which places can be reached by bus. So I will show you how you can um, use R to see where you make your next weekend trip. So if there is nice weather, check if, the, if you can reach within time. So to the person of mine, my name is Thomas Hyde. And to my technical background, I studied physics at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg. Afterwards, I made a PhD in neutrino astronomy. And now I switched to a consultancy in the area of business intelligence. And that's the reason why I do this talk is I like to use public transport and I want to support it. And this also is some hobby project. So in normal day work, I would have to do so much with um, timetables and public transport. If you want to contact me, my address is here. And so let's start with a question, what I want to tell you. What can I do today if I go by bus? So let's imagine you have want only to go one hour by bus, then where can I go? Can I reach this? wonderful lake, or is it possible to go to, to this mountain so that one bus reaches this? And what's more important, I think, is not to go there, but at the evening, you want to go home again. So you have to 
makes this question more broader and ask how long can I stay at this location? So perhaps for a visit of the sea, you want to stay one hour to surround the sea. But if it's not uh, possible, you perhaps should do some other location. Okay, and in this talk, I will focus on solving this problem. Don't go beyond these two questions. And the overall aim of this talk and this project was to introduce myself to timetables and dealing with public transport in air, make some nice maps to see the results, also introduce me to spatial analysis. And finally, I want to show you that I found, found a good visualization of the answer to my questions. And let's ask for ingredients, which I'm using here. First of all, I need some um, timetables or um, public transport data, which can be found with um, from your public transport agency, which you are interested in. Then further, you need some some map where I want to show where can I go to, and of course you must decide when to start and when to stop your trip um, to see where can I go. First ingredients, yes, I use R because we are visiting here our R conference. And so I have to use R. Of course, in normal life, I also use Python in my context. For development, I use also the R Studio I wanted men to mention. Okay. So first, let's start with in looking into the um, public transport data, so timetables, where are the routes, what trips are possible, and what um, on what days are there trips from A to B. There is an exchange format for public transport, which is called GTFS, the General Transit Feed Specification, which is a um, common standard to store and to provide the timetable data. Here on the left side, you see five major parts of these um, data. It's the agency, um, so the provider of the bus, which powers the bus, the route. So perhaps there is one route from Berlin to Warsaw. That would be one route. And a trip on the next stage is an actual, um, if a bus goes directly from Berlin to Warsaw at nine o'clock on Christmas day, then this you would call a trip. And on your trip, you stop on some stations, which are called here stops on the very bottom that are where the, where the stop, uh, bus stops, you can get off and on. And the times where this happens are stored in the stop times um, files. And as you see, these are connected with some IDs. There are further data like transfers, the calendar for you to help you to um, get more details about the table, but here I want to show only this on this side. You can find the definition of this GTFS at the uh, side of Google, as it was also in, in initially developed by Google. So here you see more um, broad was what is also possible, as I saw say said already. There are also in calendar which says on which days and trip um, is, is, is underway. But what I want to highlight here on this slide are this table of stop times. What is interesting here is that each stop has an 
ID, uh, so each, each stop has an ID. So where that could be Berlin or Nuremberg, as in my case, and also an arrival and departure time. And of course, the trip ID is very important because um, the bus can reach multiple stops in sequence, as you see in the stop sequence table. There is numbering from one to the number in this um, trip. And each trip is identified by the trip ID. And that's where we can start with the routing. There is some very nice um, algorithm, which I thought I want to highlight here because I find it very easy to understand the round-based public transport routing algorithm, which will also you be used in the R package, which I'm showing you later on. So you see here two, two, two trips from bottom left to bottom top right and um, some uh, from left to right. So let's start at the stop number one in the blue circle and then move along the blue line all the stops can be reached on this trip. And now we see stop four. There you can make a transfer to the other trip and move in the upward direction because all the numbers are numbers of a stop sequence and it will increase with the sequence. And now one could think that there, you have to implement this by your own, but as most often in the R community, there is already and package for something. So there is tidy transit for which you can read GTFS SIPs and make the routing with these algorithms I showed you later. You can find this um, package, of course, on the web page. Alternatives would be GTF router, which is an, also can route. But for my um, purposes, it was more convenient to use the tidy transit. It was easier to handle the GTFs. Which I used, they were really nice and easy in, in line. So here is, you see how, how I did it. Loading the library, tidy transit, reading the data. The next two lines is save RDS and read RDS. Oh, only for convenient, I wanted to show you that I saved it and read it again from an RDS because there's reading from zip file. In the zip file, there are CSV files and that take a quite a long time to get, um, get it read. Afterwards, you filter simply some time I took here and also all following plots out around this time. So 12 o'clock to 15 o'clock and starting as this stop, which is um, identified by this ID. And then Raptor using this function, you get all first arrival times at all, all the stops which you can reach. And now you, we have to map somewhere. For that, I use leaflet. It's for interactive web pages. There is also an R package. Alternatives I saw were Tmap which are more convenient for um, some static maps, I would say. And it's layer-based and building up a grammar. So here is a small example, but let's go to the next slide where we see it in action. So first I take the data. Some this PAL is a palette for the colors I want to show on the map. And then the last part, the leaflet. First initialize a map, and then add part apart all the, all the parts you want to map. First, some tiles that are backgrounds, which are shown like here, like the OSM maps, which I get from Thunder Forest. It's a very nice thing. And exact, um, especially the transport network was already there, which I very nice for me. And then I added circles, circle markers for each stop, which I can reach and the color identified by these color palettes, identified by the time. And then of course, some legend in the next last step, as you can see here. And now let's see the first plot. 
and starting at 12 o'clock and ending 15 o'clock. Each marker is one stop. And you see here some of this visualization is not very um, nice here. So I decided to sort my markers and I find now the right colors. So from bright to price early arrival and late arrival. So on the left of the um, the more bright um, colors there, we start our journey and move to this bigger blob. This is a big city near the start. It's around here um, 50 kilometers in distance. We see a nice, already with these simple markers, you can make some kind of heat map and see what is going on and also the routes along these lines of trains are visible. Of course, we wanted to go back, so we, get, we have to look for the last departure. So start at the, at the big city on the right. When did I have to start to reach the left area of this plot? So you see here, it's the far more on the left, the brighter the color, 12 o'clock in this case. And at the end on the left, somewhere there is this marker, very dark red. There you have to start at 15 o'clock because you are already there. So you don't need any time to stop there. Okay, and now combine these two plots to one last departure minus first arrival. And I hope of course for larger than zero. And here you see the problem in the very dark, you can stay very long because you don't go so far but already going not so far from the starting point you have to wait have to go back very early to reach your starting point again you see the map and the possible outcomes are very dense uh, dense to a small number okay. and i also think this visualization it's very convenient. You see the, or you can imagine where the train or the bus goes along. And more ideas would be to the maximal stay, could be some size of the marker and show directly the routes which the bus takes. And now two summary slides. Um, as a traveler, I would say I can reach a lot of places by bus when I don't want to go back. If I want to go back, this day might be short or I, would, I have to take more than three hours as in our example. And this were very static. You could zoom in, but you can uh, not change the starting point or the time. So I would like a web app or something like let's say using Shiny. As a developer, I saw the FS package simple features which will be interesting for future analysis and take to get this um, size um, coded um, time. And I saw leaflet is a very easy way to make interactive maps. So thank you for your attention. And I hope you will use the bus in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for, the, for this fantastic presentation. Uh, I see we still have two minutes left, so uh, I will check if we have any questions of, uh, on our YouTube chat. Yeah, so for now we don't have any questions, but again, just as a reminder, you can ask questions later on our Slack and contact every one of the prolegants. Yeah, so thank you, Thomas, once again, and we will go with our next presentation. Our prolegant will be used to Kleidisch, and she will talk about Micro simulation tax model for Poland. The floor is yours, sister. Now. You still know you are muted. Yeah. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Justyna Kleidesz. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, simulating tax reforms. Uh, I work for the Ministry of Finance and uh, one of the core tasks in our team is to uh, evaluate tax proposals, um, the effects of tax proposals before they eventually come into force. Uh, 
Uh, so I want to share with you uh, the nuts and bolts uh, of performing this task. Um, as all, almost all of us pay taxes, I hope this uh, our application will not be too abstract. Um, and uh, I will start with some policy questions that motivate micro simulation. Uh, then I will introduce our micro simulation tax model. Uh, I will show some simple examples uh, and also show you some sorts of output uh, we can produce on uh, full tax return data. And I also discuss some challenges uh, related uh, to micro simulation modeling. Uh, so let's start with the questions. Um, how much will a tax reform cost? Who wins and who loses? Uh, these are the crucial questions that one would like to answer when designing uh, a policy change. Um, so our goal uh, is first of all to evaluate the total revenue effect of a tax reform, uh, but then we also want to uh, assess uh, distributional effects. So for example, impact across income details, uh, what will be the change in effective tax rates, uh, which groups of society uh, will gain or lose on a tax change, uh, so in general, uh, we want to provide the best possible evidence to uh, make a policy decision. Um, and microsimulation micro tax model um, is a powerful tool to perform such analysis because we carry out calculations on individual level. Uh, so uh, microsimulation takes into account the heterogeneity of agents, in our case, taxpayers, families, or firms. Um, it, the model is very detailed uh, because we have very detailed information on income source, sources, deductions, and so on. Uh, from tax forms, we can also apply almost all tax rules uh, to compute tax liability. Uh, in this case, uh, detailed uh, also means that the model is complex, but we can deal uh, somehow with this complexity by splitting uh, the model into multiple uh, smaller modules. Uh, Microdata is the key element uh, in this kind of modeling uh, and in the ministry we work in a very data rich environment. Uh, we use administrative data uh, yearly, we have approximately uh, 28 million tax returns. Uh, in addition, we merge this data with other data sources such as social security data. Uh, in the end, we are interested in an aggregated output, uh, which is aggregated across different subgroups of population. So for example, income details, income categor categories or family types. Mm, there are certain fixed steps uh, in every micro simulation. Uh, so first we load the model. In our case, we load a single object which, is, uh, which uh, embeds uh, data parameters and the script. Mm, and I will describe this object in a bit. Uh, we, define, we then define scenarios. Uh, we always need to define the baseline uh, and then we define one or more uh, alternative policy proposals. Um, a scenario can come, into for, can come in form of uh, ch parameter change or change in functions, uh, but we can also uh, have uh, change to variables. For example, to replace one variable with another uh, in a simulated scenario. Uh, then we simulate scenarios, uh, we aggregate results and generate the report. Um, uh, here uh, are the our packages that are the backbone of our model. Uh, so first we used R6. Um, R6 enables us to create our own class of objects. Uh, it's basically an environment with particular stru structure. Uh, then we use data table for fast data wrangling uh, of big data sets. Um, and then we have also our in-house package, uh, MicroSim. Uh, which uh, contains uh, many helper function to uh, conduct micro simulations. So for example, um, you can define a new class of objects, you can create the model, uh, simulate multiple scenarios or tabulate uh, the results. Uh, and we use our markdown to create the report. Mm. Now I want to uh, tell a bit more about this micro model class of objects. 
uh, to start with, uh, as I said before, the model consists of multiple modules. Uh, these modules differ with respect, for example, data uh, or tax rules. For example, in Poland, we have the progressive scale, uh, the flat tax uh, and uh, other forms of taxation. Um, and each module uh, is an instance of a micro model class. We have defined this class to uh, better describe uh, um the object and its functionality uh, so each object has certain attributes and methods uh, attributes are what do we need to describe this object and first of all it's it, it's data from tax records uh, uh, it's parameters uh, of tax code and functions uh, so tax rules uh, and we also have the script uh, in this object, we, we, um, which is basically the recipe how to apply tax rules and parameters to arrive uh, at uh, variables of our interest. Um, and what is the functionality of this object? So the basic functionality is to simulate a new uh, data set uh, given these data parameters and the script. Mm, yeah, so I want to show you a very simple example. Uh, let's call this system a simple tax. In this system, we only have uh, a one tax rate of 0 0.3. Uh, we also have a tax-free amount of 100. Uh, and to calculate your tax, you simply deduct tax-free amount from your income and then you multiply uh, by tax rate. And we want to arrive at, we want to calculate your tax and uh, your net income. Um, so we create the model based on this script using create model function. And we'll, now we have uh, an object mode of micro model class. Uh, and we can assess different fields of this object. For example, I can access data uh, or parameters and the script. Uh, and you can see uh, that my function uh, create model uh, has assigned different parts of the script uh, to relevant fields uh, in my object. And I also have a method um, here. Uh, it's a function simulate. Uh, basically, when I call this function, in, it simulates um, a new data set uh, given my original data, uh, my parameters and the script. So you can think of it as uh, a simulation of uh, the baseline scenario. But um, most of the time uh, we want to uh, simulate more than just the baseline. Uh, we want to simulate uh, alternative tax proposals. So for example, let's introduce uh, a lower tax rate. And now we are going to cut the tax rate from 0 0.3 to 0 0.1. Uh, so we define the lower rate scenario uh, and we just simulate scenarios. Uh, and here is our output. We had only three taxpayers. So um, for each taxpayer now we have some values of the variables in under baseline and under lower uh, rate scenario. Uh, we have here taxpayer ID, uh, tax liability, and net income. Uh, indeed, under lower rate scenario, the uh, absolute tax uh, is lower than under baseline. And this data is already nicely prepared for uh, further aggregations. Um, but simulating uh, but a new scenario not, uh, all, uh, does not always mean that we change the parameters or functions. Sometimes it means that we want to introduce some changes to variables. Uh, for example, uh, imagine now that we want to introduce in our very simple system a universal basic income. And we would like to add 100 uh, to income of every taxpayer. Um, so now we introduce certain change to variables uh, and we define scenario basic income. Uh, in this scenario, we define two new variables. One is basic income of 100 and the other is income, which is basically rede uh, redefining uh, the original income variable, which is now will be new income, will be income plus uh, basic income. And so you can see this is written in a form of a string and this 
uh, string will be added to uh, our original script to define these variables before um, the simulation uh, is run. Uh, and again, uh, we uh, run our function, we call our function simulate scenarios. And this is our output. Uh, again, we have um, taxpayer ID, tax and net income as in the previous uh, simulation. We have values of these variables under baseline and basic income scenario. Uh, but we also have two additional variables that were defined uh, in our new scenario under basic income. Mm, and you can see uh, that the tax liability uh, is higher uh, under basic income scenario than uh, under baseline, uh, but also the net income is higher uh, because uh, each taxpayer received a certain fixed uh, transfer. Uh, now I want to, I would like to move on uh, exemplary micro simulation on uh, real data, on PIT data. Uh, and here uh, we have a hypothetical reform. Uh, we are going to decrease speed rate from 20% to 18%. And as you can see, uh, both the baseline and the simulated, simulated scenario are made up only for this demonstration purposes for this presentation. Um, and what we have here, uh, here of course we have the complete view on the whole population. Uh, first of all, we can look at uh, the change uh, in revenue. Uh, here we have the revenue loss aggregated across income details. You can also view it as taxpayers gain. Um, uh, in here, in the middle graph, uh, we have change in effective tax rate. Uh, so now the tax burden, here, here's the basically change in tax burden relative uh, to gross income across income details. Uh, and finally, we have percentage of winners uh, in details. Uh, in this kind of reform, um, of course, uh, either you can uh, be neutral or you can uh, be a winner. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, basically uh, the output of a static model. Um, but we need to bear in mind that um, usually tax reform uh, triggers some behavioral effects. Um, so modeling behavior responses is one of the uh, challenges, and challenges and big tasks uh, in this model. It is interesting both from uh, the policy debate perspective, but also uh, from the academic perspective. Um, here we basically uh, ask how uh, would taxpayer, uh, taxpayers respond to taxes. Uh, so for example, if we uh, introduce a tax cut, tax cut um, maybe some uh, taxpayers will work more and so thus we will um, have a certain an indirect effect of increased revenue uh, through increased uh, activity. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for example, a tax hike can make some, can introduce some incentives to work less or uh, to avoid taxes and, for example, shift income from uh, one tax base to another tax base, which is uh, more leniently taxed. Mm. So this is one challenge, uh, introducing these behavioral responses uh, to a model. Uh, another challenge, uh, I would say, is combining multiple modules. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can imagine a change in social security rates. Uh, then this change transfers to a change in tax revenue because of uh, different interactions uh, between these two systems. And then, of course, we have a change in disposable incomes. Uh, and so the eligibility, uh, eligibility for benefits is affected. Um, so another thing we are working towards is to make these transitions smooth uh, and to um, extend the model by different modules to uh, capture the complete picture uh, of the system. Um, yeah, that's, I arrived at the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions on Slack or YouTube chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justyna. So we still have one minute left, so let me check if we have 
Any questions? Yeah, so on YouTube, we don't have any questions, but let me say that was a really interesting presentation, especially for me, because I'm from Poland also. <laughs> so I, I didn't know that Ministry of Finance is using their own air packages. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. Let's, go, let's go for <laughs> our don't. next presentation. So our next prelegant will be Takuma Koshimi. Uh, and basically the, fro the floor is yours. Right. Hello everyone. Thank you all for coming today. It is great honor to be able to speak to you. Today, I would like to talk about the benefits of introducing R and developing an in-house R package. Let me brief, briefly introduce myself first. My name is Takuma and I work for a marketing research company called Values in Japan. I am responsible for leading a data analytics team that uses R to conduct both quantitative and qualitative research related to web marketing. The goal of this presentation is to inspire you to think about making more use of R in your team. To that end, I would like to explain the process of how a team grew up by incorporating R. Especially taking our team as an example, I would like to convey the difficulty in developing the in-house R package, how to deal with them, the benefits of the development, and the lessons learned from them. Our team didn't have engineering abilities at first, and we've improved our analytical and engineering skills with R. In the beginning, nobody was using R and to do analytical work. We were all using non-engineer geared business intelligence tools. The BI tool we used was convenient and robust, but there are limits to what it could do. There were not many analysis options. It could only handle limited amounts of data. And most importantly, it was difficult for us to train each other how to operate the system through the GUI in order to reproduce results reliably. And we met R and Tidy Bar. When I studied R package Tidy Bar, I understood how Tidy Bus was designed to be easy for anyone to understand. And I thought that it could be adapted by the entire team. Now, through in house training and practical use at work, almost everyone in our team has come to use R as an essential tool for their work. Because R has R has become the team's quarter and the process of analysis can be left at stake. The analysis has become more reproducible and code reviews and knowledge sharing within the team has become more popular. The amount of data that can be handled has also increased compared to when using BI tools. And the benefits of interactive, interactive processing by the program have greatly improved work efficiency. In this way, R has increased the efficiency and the reproducibility of the analysis and the range of what our team can do. I don't think need to explain any further why Tidy Bus is great too. Because all of you guys must be the residents in Tidy Bus. After our team had got acquainted with Tidy Bus, we set out to develop the in house R package that could take us to the next level. We created an in house R package barrel to perform frequent tasks, including data extraction, processing, analysis, visualization, and notification. It is now an indispensable tool for our teams.
I would like to explain why I came up with the development of the in-house R package. First, when you do the work of analysis in your business, you need to deal with the rules and problems specific to your own company. These could be security issues or two issues. These issues reduce efficiency and block reproducibility. And to make matters worse, they can also be out of the control of the individual. What we needed was to build systematic mechanisms that worked outside the individual. Second, as the number of the team members increased, I began to want to achieve the dry principle as a team. The same code I'm writing in one place may be being written by three other people on the team at the same time. With this motivation, we did make, started making the package. However, the benefits of making package have not been focused only on these two issues. I would like to give you some actual examples. First, we made it easy to extract the data. This article of Airbnb states that simplifying data extraction should be the first step in team package development. When you think of extraction, you may come up with ODBC connection. But there are some cases where it is not possible to deal with just setting the host and port with a function. In this situation, it may be difficult to solve with R alone. Our organization is no exception. There was a problem that individuals couldn't directly access the database for security reasons. We address these issues by creating a function that works with AWS service. The process written in R is a simple script that puts a query in S3, monitors a bucket of S3 that returns the results, and reads it. By doing this, R realizes the same UI as ODBC connection. Since EC2 or Lambda on AWS through the query and put the results. Until now, data was extracted through several separate steps, but now it is possible to extract data from RStudio with a single function. By linking R with other services such as AWS, you can realize powerful functions that cannot be achieved with R alone. Connecting to AWS was very easy by using the R package AWS S3. In addition, we're working on improvement of operational efficiency. I think that you will can come across situations where you need to do what R is not good at with R. In such a case, consider leading it to another language. You can use Python with the R package reticulate, and you can use the JavaScript library with the R package V8. I think it is a good idea to collaborate with engineers, even if they are not data analysts. You can ask them for information about other language packages. Here is the example of how we can combine R with JavaScript to send a post to Slack. JavaScript is used to format SQL. Next, I worked on the fun uh, functionalization of analysis that we often have to perform. The goal was to implement the dry principle on the team scale. When we manage the analysis in the in-house package, we realize the advantage of being able to include knowledge in functions in addition to the dry principles. If there are several patterns in the analysis, the selection of those patterns is added as an argument and expressed on the function. If there is a program that creates a bug, 
it will be fixed by another member who finds it. And other members will not follow the same bug after that. In this way, the program of the function and the arguments contained in the function reflects the anonymity and knowledge of a team members. It's a way of sharing knowledge that goes one step further than documentation. Third, we created function to deal with tasks which were performed using organization-specific tools. Is there data that can only be retrieved from a specific management screen or data that cannot be aggregated without passing through a specific tool? With these tools, you have to leave RStudio and open a Chrome browser or dedicated software. The operation of the browser and dedicated tools doesn't remain in the code which is troublesome and reduce reproducibility. Consider whether you can replace a request with our package HTTR, or if you can't, consider to use our package R Selenium or Chromium to control your browser. These allow us to do almost any work from our studio. It's valuable to have a working environment that doesn't require us to leave our studio. In summary, the main points of my presentation are listed up here. By linking out with cloud like AWS, you can create powerful functions that cannot be achieved in a generic package. Let's read what R is not good at to other languages. In-house R package is not just a collection of useful functions, but also a collection of knowledge. If possible, break away from legacy web tools and get reproducibility. By following, what I want to tell you in this presentation and developing an R package as a foundation of your team, you can improve the efficiency technical ability and the capability of your team. Thank you. Enjoy our thank you. Thank you very much, Takuma, for your presentation. So we still have three minutes left. Let me check if there are any questions. Yeah, so we still don't have any questions on our YouTube chat. But again, you can ask all of your questions later on, and you can find Takuma on our uh, chat on Slack. So it's time for our yeah. next prelegant. Uh, it will be Alizera Yazdami, and he will talk about the prediction of recessions. So the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Perfect. Okay. And let me just share my screen. Quick. So can you now see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where, wherever you are. And uh, first and foremost, thanks to the YR Foundation for organizing such a great conference and uh, providing this opportunity for us uh, data scientists and our enthusiasts to present our works and uh, discuss. So um, this morning, I have a pleasure to um, tell you a little bit of uh, a project I've recently been involved with re related to applications of machine learning uh, for prediction of recessions. And uh, um, there is some um, kind of uh, technicality involved in that. In particular, um, we, we, are sh we are kind of showcasing that why this, why this problem is kind of better dealt with through an imbalanced classification approach and how we can apply different machine learning algorithms as well as a wide range of uh, um, evaluation metrics to better understand and evaluate our predictions and our models. Um, probably 
doesn't surprise uh, anybody, most of us. Um, that's why we are interested in predicting uh, business cycles and recessions. As individuals, of, of course, we care about that because that impacts our daily lives and uh, employment and so on and so forth. But also as um, policymakers or investors or economists, uh, there, are, there are various reasons to kind of closely investigate this issue and uh, try and come up with alternative strategies and monetary and fiscal policies and so on. And um, with particular focus of this presentation, uh, we are looking at the United States recession, historical recessions, but um, these methods uh, lend themselves to other countries as well. And it's sub subject to some modifications, of course, uh, uh, applying regional uh, kind of uh, uh, variables and ideas. Um, the research on forecasting uh, United States recessions date, dates back to early 1990s, maybe even earlier than that. And um, usually the emphasis in the literature, in the econometrics literature, has been to identify the main financial drivers, financial predictors of recessions, such as uh, various interest rates and yield curve, uh, the uh, spread, the difference between uh, long and short term interest rates. The stock market, as you can imagine, um, last but not least, unemployment rates and non-farm payrolls uh, in terms of dollar amounts. Um, however, uh, dominantly, the modeling approach has been using a probit uh, with binary response of recession versus non-recession and estimating probability of recession in a given month using uh, these financial variables. So um, naturally, with uh, all the advancements in machine learning and data-driven techniques, we asked if machine learning can help. And um, there is some uh, good reasons there. Obviously, Probit is a decent model, has been used in uh, many con contexts for several uh, decades uh, and uh, with, with usually very good results. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, it's a linear model and um, when we apply the uh, probit model to prediction of recession, it gives us constant betas, constant co regression coefficients across all recessions. So it's not as dy dynamic. Uh, but on the other hand, the econ economy is evolving and relationships change. And machine learning may hold some promise there in terms of capturing these conditionality, nonlinear, nonlinearity, and uh, changing relationships. So it's more data-driven in that sense. And uh, doesn't have to be limited to or restricted to linearity. So we don't have that kind of prior. Um, we are also able to um, apply different range of different types of algorithms, by, for example, in this case, binary classification algorithms, and compare them and uh, gain more insight from, from this comparison. Um, uh, last but not least, um, we understand that uh, recessions happen uh, like every 10, 20, 15 years or whatever the case may be, according to their definitions and uh, in, in consecutive months usually. So there is this uh, uh, rarity of recessions, but also clustering of them when they happen. So it's kind of a uh, mixed scenario there. And uh, um, I thought that imbalanced classification uh, as we are familiar in machine learning terminology might be very useful. Uh, just a quick background on the data. So. Um, I obtained the data for this uh, particular project um, entirely from uh, Federal Reserve and uh, NBER databases that are open and online and accessible to everybody. Fred or Federal Reserve basically gives you a wide range of uh, economic, uh, econometric, macroeconomic data. NBER data provides you with uh, historical recessions. And uh, the table on the right-hand side shows you a number of predictors that I have used for this particular project. These uh, predictors, these time series are um, um, mentioned in the literature frequently. So I thought these are really 
the main drivers that we could focus on. Uh, again, emphasizing that the focus hasn't been to um, feature select or feature engineer here. It's been more to utilize the existing features and known, known drivers and apply different machine learning techniques. So we are focusing more on the modeling side and uh, it's uh, nitty gritty rather than uh, coming up with new predictors. And of course, uh, as it's customary in financial econometrics, we apply uh, differencing and logarithms and things like that in order to make our time series stationary so that we can use them in the model, uh, but also uh, to uh, have better intuition about them. The data is spanning uh, from 1959 to end of 2019. This analysis was done back then. Now I have the opportunity with more data becoming available to kind of extend it. But for this, for this presentation, we are seeing, uh, we were looking at the results for that time period. <clears throat> and as you can see, um, the ch chart in the bottom shows the historical uh, recessions, uh, recession months. Um, as you can see, it's happening uh, every decade or so, more or less. Uh, a couple of months, three months, four months, sometimes, uh, depending on the type and depth of recession. And then uh, overall, as far as the uh, classification uh, problem is concerned, there is a six to one class ratio. So um, it's like uh, about 14% of my data uh, are flagged as historical recession. And that's a moderate to severe kind of imbalance situation, depending on how you define that. Uh, for the R code, I'm basically using uh, uh, the tidyverse and quant mode packages first and foremost. Of course, I'm using a number of other packages along the way, but these are to basically um, obtain the data and wrangle the data to the format and transform, transform the data to the format that I'm interested in. And um, I'm... I, I have posted the full R code for this project on my GitHub page, and I can share you uh, share with you the link. Um, as far as pre-processing data, especially with regards to class imbalances, there are a number of um, uh, ways to kind of uh, subsample from your data. So. Um, depending on how large your data set is, uh, how uh, skewed your classes are, and uh, I mean, class uh, balances are, and so on. Uh, typically upsampling, downsampling, and hybrid methods are standard ones. Um, hybrid method is gathering momentum these days. Uh, one example is SMOTH, uh, synthetic minority oversampling uh, technique. Um, in this particular case, for a number of reasons that are all uh, kind of discussed in the paper that's accompanied this, this analysis, I have decided to use a downsampling approach. And uh, at the end of the day, when I ran the comparisons, that gave me the best results. So um, for, for this analysis, I'm using downsampling. And um, I split my data into standard training versus testing uh, kind of samples about uh, uh, 80 20 is kind of split uh, from 1959 to 2006. Um, that has uh, like 80% of total data, about 14% of recessions. Uh, and then for the test sample from 2007 to 2019, which has about 12% of flagged uh, recession. And the good thing about test sample, or maybe not so good thing about test sample is that it's right at the start or beginning of the financial recessions of uh, global recessions or global uh, economic downturn of 2008, 2009 crisis. So that it's a real challenge for any model to be able to kind of predict the, that particular period given that it's been trained on a past period. Um, another consideration is that we are dealing with time series here and the serial dependency and ordering of the terms matters or observations matters. So for that reason, I'm using a walk forward time series cross validation scheme, which again, R is a fantastic uh, tool to implement that. Uh, there are multiple packages that have that option, but also you could easily code that uh, in R. And uh, here is what basically I'm using. Um, so uh, not surprisingly, as I'm running um, a number of machine learning algorithms and predictive models, I'm using a carrot package. There are of course up, uh, upgraded versions of carrot, but also other machine learning, uh, machine, machine learning packages uh, uh, available through R and uh, they are as powerful and as, as uh, useful. But also um, in this particular case, I decided to use carrots and uh, 
for to define my kind of sampling period, I'm using a time slice uh, as opposed to standard cross validation, for example, um, uh, because cross validation doesn't preserve the order, whereas the time time slice or time time uh, slice cross validation it does. So I'm using this approach, and then uh, all other specifications related to up sampling, down sampling, smooth sampling, etc. And I'm kind of specifying two class summary and a binary classification. So as far as the models, I'm um, sticking with the probit as a benchmark model because I want to make sure obviously uh, if machine learning models uh, first of all provide better prediction but also better more insight into in the, this particular problem uh, the glam nets which is a generalized linear model with regularization is a combination of lasso and race regression uh, support vector machine obviously is a very powerful algorithm as far as classification is concerned um, tree based methods random forest and XG boost ensemble with regularization and, uh, and of obviously neural network is also a, a big uh, important player in this, but I'm trying to keep it really simple. I don't wanna uh, come up with a black box of a predictor of recessions using neural network, because again, I'm trying to gain insight of that. Um, as far as the uh, metrics that I'm employing in order to better understand my predictions and uh, also what's going on in the model and what ha what's happening in my data, I'm looking across a range, not only one or two, because especially this is a imbalanced classification. And for example, the first one, the accuracy rate, which is a proportion of correctly uh, predicted cases, is notoriously uh, bad at uh, imbalanced classification. It gives you a skewed view because obviously your algorithm could bias towards the majority class and ignore the minority class and accuracy rates uh, still very high. So it, it's kind of misleading. So for, for that reason, I'm using a, a range of these um, evaluation metrics, precision, recall, specificity, area under curve obviously is important one, F score, the harmonic mean of precision recall, H measure, which I really liked, especially like I learned about it a lot during this project, which is a misclassification cost weight metric. And that can be, you can apply a, a penalty uh, parameter in order to um, basically weight your misclassification uh, cost uh, for one uh, versus the other class. And that gives you a better picture of how good your algorithm is performing on the minority class. And Kolmogorov Smirnov is an author another one which gives you a distinguishing power of your model. So with that, um, obviously, I mean, uh, the, the model training code becomes kind of straightforward. We are using carrot here and we are using, this shows the uh, XG boost example with three and uh, a number of like uh, kind of uh, hyperparameters. And uh, you could design the hyperparameter set yourself, or you could just let it let the model find itself. And in this particular case, as you can see, I'm commented out the, the tune grid. So I let the model come up with its own hyperparameter sets and range so that uh, I'm not kind of interfering too much with it. And then obviously as far uh, down below, as far as uh, all the uh, kind of explanatory uh, aspects of the results, confusion matrix. Uh, uh, I'm plotting also the variable importance plot and uh, partial dependency plots. There are a number of other packages that I'm using. So, uh, like I said, the code is out there. You can you can check them out, and also the RSC plots and so on and so forth. So, moving on quickly to the training results for the training sample. Um, what I'm seeing that generally the models are very, very close as we expected probably, but also um, if we look at the model RC curves, we could see that random forest algorithm really distinguishes itself from all others. Uh, so it looks like random forest is doing, uh, which is a uh, kind of a ensemble methodology uh, works really well. And uh, when we are looking at the um, table on the left hand side, we are also seeing the random forest pretty much across all uh, metrics or evaluation metrics or measures does, does a, a better job than the others. Usually the best, but sometimes uh, the second also. And uh, something interesting that is um, as far as um, sensitivity level, it achieves 100% accuracy. So it's uh, basically it's 100% uh, positive rate. And uh, that's good because it's capturing all the recessions. 
Um, so variable importance, we have it here. Again, uh, these are things that if you are familiar with the context uh, in this particular problem, you would expect that yield curve, uh, uh, non-farm payrolls and uh, industrial production index and a few others are important. So th that we are showing, we are, sh we are seeing that same, same is happening here. Uh, those variables are important. The partial dependency plot basically shows you the relationship between how the model utilizes a particular variable, in this case, uh, uh, payrolls. And uh, it's basically showing that it's uh, nonlinear as opposed to linear, but you could also kind of apply interpretation in, in terms of, oh, uh, this level looks like it's going up, at a certain level looks like it's flattening and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't wanna spend too much time on that. And um, as far as the test sample results, we are seeing that the models are, as far as the ROC curve on the right hand side, they are kind of close. But also, uh, when, look, when we look at across, when we look across across different nasty methods or different, um, I'm sorry, um, evaluation measures, we are seeing that random forest generally comes at the top again, and. Uh, uh, achieving good results as far as both uh, positive uh, and negative rates. And um, finally, uh, I'd like to show the full sample results. This is not. This is basically putting together all the predictions. So I'm not run rerunning the or I'm not recalibrating the algorithms using full sample. I'm just uh, using the in sample and out of sample predictions from whatever I calibrated and those algorithms and put them together and recalculating the measure. So basically just, just an update of the table. And um, again, not surprisingly, because Random Forest did best on both uh, training and test samples, it also does best here. And uh, the chart on the right hand side is also interesting because it's, uh, it's showing that Random Forest, uh, this is for Random Forest, uh, it's showing that Random Forest predicts very well all the historical recessions, which are gray bars, uh, but also, uh, in the end of uh, 2019, early 2020, it shows elevated recessions, which is uh, uh, when this analysis was done, these were not flagged as historical recession by NBR, but then later on uh, they were because obviously we entered the pa global pandemic and uh, trade wars and all that. And they, the model really captured that in early stages. And uh, it showed that uh, we are entering or we are uh, like, probabilities of recession in those particular months are higher than normal. And with that, I want to conclude uh, uh, with uh, saying that, um, as we know, traditional models are usually descent, but they have limitations in terms of uh, capturing nonlinearity and interactions and other dynamic, evolving dynamics of the economy. Uh, but uh, better way of better, but there are better ways to predict recessions, and in general, that can be applied to many other domains, and that's uh, by uh, conducting careful resampling mechanisms and uh, uh, also uh, processing nonlinear and interactive uh, relationships with their data. And uh, with that, I'd like to take you to the resources and uh, thank you for your attention. Like I said, the R code for this work is uh, on my GitHub page. So feel free to check it out and uh, let me know your feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ali Reza. Uh, that's what, that was really insightful presentation. So unfortunately, we couldn't reach our last presenter. So this, was co this will conclude our session. Uh, I would like to... Once again, thanks to all, all of the presenters for your work. And for the viewers, um, once again, you can ask all the questions on our wire Slack and hopefully see you soon on later present.